Hi, I'm Miss Hearn. Let's get started. In this video, we're going to introduce the subject of logic, and we're going to talk about statements and quantifiers in particular. A statement is defined as a declarative sentence that's either true or false, but not both simultaneously. So let's determine whether each of these sentences is considered a logical statement. A, the earth revolves around the sun. So this is a declarative sentence, and we can determine whether it's true or false, but it can't be both true and false simultaneously, so it's a logical statement. Part B, the sun revolves around the earth. Even though that's false, it's okay. It's still considered a statement. Remember, statements can be true or false as long as they're not both simultaneously, and it is a declarative sentence, so that's a statement. Part C, one plus two equals three. Although this sentence is written in mathematical symbols, it is a sentence, it is a declarative sentence, and we can determine if it's true or false, so it's a statement as well. How do you spell your name? Well, this fails the very first condition that it be a declarative sentence. It's in fact a question, so it's not a statement. This sentence is false. This is a tricky one. It is a declarative sentence. Now let's suppose that we assumed that it's referring to itself, right? When it says this sentence is false, it's referring to itself. In that case, if we assume that the sentence is true, then it contradicts us because it says it's false. If we assume it's false, then by saying it's false, it's saying it's true. So we have a paradox. So this is one of those cases where it can be both simultaneously, and so it's not actually considered a logical statement. Alan is not a good student. While this is a declarative sentence, they're not telling us the conditions that determine whether someone is a good student. It's more of an opinion. So this would not be a good example of a statement. Now, when we join two simple statements together, like the ones we just saw, we get what's called a compound statement. The statements that make up the compound statement are called component statements, and we connect them with words that are referred to as connectives, like and, or, not, and if then. So for example, I could take any of the connectives and, or, but, and if then, and join any of these three simple statements. Mathematics is mental exercise, push-ups are physical exercise, I will exercise. Let's say we wanted to connect two of them with the word and. We could say something like, push-ups are physical exercise and I will exercise. Or perhaps we would want to use the connective if then. This is an interesting one because it's not just one word. In fact, it's not a phrase. You put the if in front of one part, one component, and you put then in front of the other. So you could have something like, if mathematics is mental exercise, then I will exercise. In your homework, you may be asked to decide whether a statement is compound or not. So let's look at these two. A, if Amanda said it, then it must be true. So in order to determine if you have a compound statement, you need to know if you have two simple statements being joined by a connective. So let's identify the components. Amanda said it is a statement. It must be true is a statement and it's being joined by the connective if then. So this is a compound statement. The gun was made by Smith and Wesson. Well, we see the word and, which is often used as a logical connective. However, in this case, it's not connecting two statements. It's con connecting the two names, Smith and Wesson. So this is actually a simple statement, not a compound statement. Now let's talk about how to negate a statement and what that means. So just as an example, the sentence Max has a car is a statement and the negation of the statement would be Max does not have a car. The basic idea is that the negation of a true statement has to be false and the negation of a false statement is true. Or in other words, so if we might be asked to write the negation of a statement. Let's start with part A. The earth revolves around the sun. There are only two possible scenarios here. Either it does or it doesn't. So the negation of the earth revolves around the sun is that the earth does not revolve around the sun. This is different from part B. In part B, we have actually various scenarios to consider. To help us think about it, suppose there were three students. Let's list all the scenarios for those three students taking or not taking 
calculus. So here a Y means yes, they're taking calculus and an N means no. And we have the students A, B, and C. So to say that all students take calculus is which one or more of these scenarios? Well, notice that each of these scenarios we've listed it out very carefully so they're each distinct. And the only one in which all of the students take calculus is scenario one. Now, so the negation has to take into account these scenarios. And what do these scenarios have in common? Well, in each of these scenarios, there's at least one student who is not taking calculus. So although we could just say, okay, not all students take calculus, we usually instead choose to say something like some students do not take calculus. And by the way, in logic, the word sum is equivalent to the phrase at least one. So in each of these scenarios that are supposed to be our negation, we have at least one student, maybe more, who's not taking calculus. In fact, in scenario eight, none of them are. A common error is to think that the negation of all students take calculus is that none of them do, and that's not true because that's just one possible scenario which would cause all students take calculus to be false. Now let's look at some students take French. Once again, we're going to list out all the possibilities. Uh, y means yes, they're taking French. N means no, they're not. Which of these scenarios makes it true to say that some students take French? Remember, in logic, the word some means at least one. So we have to include any scenarios in which at least one of the students is taking French. And that is going to be scenarios one through seven. So the only negation of that is scenario eight. That's the only time when our statement would be false, is when A is not taking French, B is not taking French, and C is not taking French. So that means that the negation of some students take French is no students take French. Remember, statement A was easier than statements B and C because there were only two possible outcomes. They, the Earth does revolve around the sun or it doesn't. What changed it, what made it harder, is in scenario B and scenario C, we had words called quantifiers that indicate a certain quantity. And when you negate that, you have to take those quantifiers into consideration. The words like all, each, every, and no one are called universal quantifiers because they describe characteristics of applying to everyone. Words and phrases such as some, there exists, for at least one, are existential quantifiers because they describe characteristics of one or more individuals. They guarantee that a certain characteristic exists somewhere, but not for everybody. So notice that when we found our negations, the negation of a universal quantifier actually involved an existential one. If I want to negate all do something, I would say some of them don't. If I want to negate some do something, I would say none of them do and vice versa. So let's look at this example. Write the negation of each statement. And by the way, it's always possible to negate a statement by saying it is not the case that and then writing the same statement. But we're gonna do that without using that little cheat. When I negate no children like green beans, I'm not gonna say it's not the case that no children like green beans, okay? So what we're gonna do is use the idea of negating existential and universal quantifiers. So no children like green beans. No one. None of them. So this statement that no children like green beans will be false if there's even one child who actually does, right? We don't need every child to like green beans to make this statement false because no is a universal quantifier. We can negate it using an existential one. Something like there is at least one child that likes green beans or some children like green beans. Now let's look at part B. Some children do not like ice cream. I don't believe it, but let's say that some children do not like ice cream. That is an existential quantifier. So we can negate it using a universal one. So when we say there is somebody who does not like it, then the opposite of that, the negation of that, what would make that false is if in fact everybody does. So all children like ice cream would be the negation. Another special case of negations is when you have a statement that involves an inequality. So I just want to remind you of the mathematical notation 
arrows pointing to the left are less than, pointing to the right are greater than, and if there's a little line underneath, that means it can be equal to or equal to. So let's consider how we would negate a statement like p is less than 3. It might help to think about what numbers would make that statement true. So for example, the number 1 is less than 3 would be true. Uh, 2 is less than 3 would be true. And in logic, by the way, we abbreviate true with just a t. But the statement 3 is less than 3, that would be false, right? So we start to see false numbers at 3. That's the first false that we get. And then any number bigger than 3, whether it be 4 or 3 and a half or whatever, would also be false. So in order for um, p less than 3 to be false, we would need p to be a number greater than or equal to 3. So you see that the negation of a less than turns out to be a greater than or equal to. And similarly with b, the negation of a greater than or equal to, that's only going to be false if we have a number that's less than. So 3x minus 2y less than 12, we're not going to include the or equal to because that was in this statement, right? And we want all the other scenarios. So the other scenarios are when this is less than. So the negation of an or equal to doesn't have that. So to summarize, the statement a less than b has the negation a greater than or equal to b. The statement a is less than or equal to b has the negation a is greater than b, or vice versa. Now we're going to focus on logical symbols. So to simplify work with logic, we use symbols. Statements are represented with letters, like variables, such as p, q, or r. Those are common ones, while several symbols are used for connectives as well. So the connective, we're going to start with the connectives and, or, and the negation. So the connective and is indicated with an upside down V and, or it, it kind of looks like an upside down V. And then the connective or is, looks like a capital right side up V. So um, I always like to emphasize when we're introducing this new symbol that, um, We've seen symbols related to the words and and or before. Where did we see those? Um, we saw in sets, when we're talking about sets, intersection was associated with the word and, and union was associated with the word or. And remember, that or was the right side up U, and and was the upside down U. So it's just like that. This is just like in the same symbols, but pointy. <laughs> and then the negation is going to be a tilde like you have in Spanish. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to use translate between symbols and words. So in part A, we have P and then the right side up V and then Q. So that's P or Q. And we're told in the instructions, let P represent it is raining and Q represent it is March. Write each symbolic statement in words. So we are going to take the statement P and the statement Q and join them with the word or. It is raining or it is March. Now for part B, we have that tilde, that little squiggle that represents a negation. Actually, we in words would say not Q and then an upside down V means and, not Q and P. So Q didn't happen and P happened. You can think of it that way. So um, in this case, since Q is the statement it is March, we're going to say it's n the negation of that, which is it is not March and um, P is raining. It is not March and it is raining. Now for part C, this is an interesting one because the negation is out front of these parentheses here. So what that's telling you is you're negating the whole statement. So you can, when you have that, we often translate it into it is not the case that, okay, and then we'll say whatever the statement is. In this case, P and Q. Okay, it is not the case that P and Q happen. So it is not the case that it is raining and it is March. That would be one way you could indicate that. This is an example directly out of our My Math Lab homework for 
MGF 1106 class that this is a lecture for. Let P and Q represent the following simple statements. P, the chair is broken. Q, it is snowing outside. We want to write the symbolic statement for, and we have not, not Q, or P. Not Q, this is the negation, the tilde, and then the right side of V, this is the or. So not Q or P. Q is it's snowing outside, so not Q would be it's not snowing outside. P is the chair is broken. So we want it is not snowing outside or the chair is broken, which is C. Now let's go the other way. Let's start with statements given in words and translate them into symbols. So we're going to let P represent the statement, the sky is blue, and Q the statement, it is summertime. Looking at part A, the sky is blue or it is not summertime. Sky is blue would be P, or would be the right side of V symbol, and it is not summertime would be it's not Q, so negation of Q. So for part A, we get P or not Q. For part B, it is not summertime. Not summertime would be not Q, but the sky is blue. The sky is blue would be P. Now, the word but is logically equivalent to and, right? It, even though there's a little bit of a connotation there, it doesn't change the, the facts. If I said it is not summertime but the sky is blue, that's the same as if I said it's not summertime and the sky is blue. When you see the word but, it's just think that it's still and, and remember and is the upside down V. So for part B, we have negation Q and P, not Q and P. For part C, it is not the case that, remember when we put it is not the case that, it, that's a negation of a parenthesis. So think of the rest being a parenthesis. It is a negation of something, the whole statement. It is summertime and the sky is blue. It is summertime is Q, the sky is blue is P, and we're joining it with an and. It is not the case that Q and P. Now, some of the questions in this section are going to rely on um, some facts from our set theory chapter. Remember, we learned about specific sets of whole numbers, the counting numbers, um, the whole numbers, the integers, rational numbers, irrational numbers, and real numbers. So you might want to review those definitions. So some of the questions are going to ask you to decide whether statements are true or false, which is really what logic is kind of all about, determining whether statements are true or false, and then later on putting a bunch of statements together into arguments and determining if the argument is valid. So in logic, we want to be a lie detector. We want to determine if we have a true or a false statement. We're going to start with part A. Every integer is a natural number. Every integer is a natural number. Well, when we say every, we mean every. So if there's even one that's not, then we have to conclude the statement is false. Can you think of an integer that's not a natural number? I can any of the negatives, for example. So um, for in this case, we could say this is false. And to justify that, negative 1 is an integer, but it's not a natural number. Now in part b, there exists. That's an existential quantifier. There exists a whole number that is not a natural number. So that means that if there's even one whole number that's not a natural number, this would be a true statement. And in fact, it is true. 0 is the only one, right? We, the whole numbers are basically just the natural numbers with zero added to it. So, but there is one whole number that's not natural. And part C, all rational numbers are real. So are the rational numbers part of the real numbers? Yes, they are. All rational numbers can be written as decimals, so they fit our definition of a real number. Now let's do this. You test yourself. Pause the video and write down what you think is a negation of each statement. Okay, now let's look at the solutions. The negation of some cats have fleas is no cats have fleas. The negation of some cats do not have fleas is all cats have fleas. The negation of no cats have fleas is some cats have fleas. Let's try another one. 
Pause the video and write the negation of each statement. Don't use a slash through the symbols to negate them. Okay, so for part A, x less than 7, the opposite of that, the negation of that that would make it false, would be x greater than or equal to 7. For part B, x less than or equal to negative 11, the negation would be x is strictly greater than negative 11. And C is kind of tricky. If x is equal to 10 and we want to negate that without putting a slash through it, what would we have to say? Well, either x is less than 10 or x is greater than 10. It just can't be equal to 10. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please remember to give it a thumbs up because that will help other students to find the video.